Um, yes, today, today we're going to talk about uh, strength and ductility in automotive extrusions. And really most of the work I'm going to show today is comes out of collaborations we've had for a number of years with the UBC, University of Waterloo and NIC in Shikutami. So what we're going to cover today, I thought seeing as we're actually in Quebec, we, we spend a few minutes just talking about what Rio Tinto and Rio Tinto Aluminium do. And then we'll get into uh, automotive applications and what, where are extrusions used and what are the challenges. And then we'll get into some work we did looking at strength ductility effects. And then the final section will talk about what we think the future directions, future challenges are for uh, research and development. So uh, Rio Tinto Aluminium is part of Rio Tinto. They're a global mining company. So we're celebrating our 145th anniversary this year since we first made copper, or first mined copper in Spain. And um, we're very active in iron ore, uh, coal, carbon, uh, diamonds, minerals, and of course, uh, aluminum. So uh, global revenues for Rio Tinto were a 42 billion last year. And in terms of the different groups within Rio Tinto, uh, aluminum was second in terms of contribution towards that. The aluminum group were fully integrated. That means we own the bauxite mines, we own the al aluminum refineries, we have our own secured power, and we have 19 cast houses around the world su supplying about over 500 customers. Uh, we have a very strong position here in Canada. We have a smelter out west in Kitimat in BC, but we have a very strong position in Quebec itself. So if you were to leave the conference today, if you drive east for three hours to Quebec City and then turn left and drive another two hours, you get to a region called the Saguenay, and sometimes called the Aluminum Valley. And there again, we have a fully integrated system. We bring bauxite in at the um, St. Lawrence and the Saguenay. We have our own port and rail system, so we bring the bauxite in, we make alumina, and then we have four smelters making about a million tons a year of liquid aluminum. And most of our power supply is hydroelectric, so uh, we've been able to certify our aluminum as being low CO2. We use a brand called Renewal, and we're about a third of the industry average for the CO2 emissions for, uh, for making aluminum. So once you make a million tons a year of aluminum, you have to decide how to freeze that. And this slide shows the different options you have for making ingot products. So at the back there, you can see a crucible of uh, a liquid aluminum. So that's how we move aluminum around the region, but we also sell liquid aluminum to, to independent cast houses. And we can keep the, the, the aluminum liquid in that crucible for about 12 hours, so we can ship a good distance. So the simplest way to freeze aluminum is to make what we call remelt. You can cast it as a sow, as you can see there, or we can cast small form. And some smelters, that's all they do. It's a very simple kind of business model. But our approach is to make what we call value-added products, which is the, the rest of the products you can see there. Basically, we're casting that into a shape. Typically, we're making an alloy. So the market rewards us with a higher premium for that by the, the value that we add. So for example, we have horizontal casters. We can make bus bar, which is used actually to make construction smelters. Um, but the, the product near the front there, T-bar, that's a big product used. Uh, we cast a lot of 356 for aluminum wheels into that product. And we also make rolling slabs. So we supply most of the major rolling companies in the world with rolling slab. We also make small form foundries. So we cast a wide range of alloys ship those small ingots to people who make shape castings, and there's a lot of activity today right now in high pressure die casting, as, you, as you're probably aware. Our most downstream product probably is Propertsy rod. So that's a continuously cast bar that then we inline a hot and cold roll into a rod that's used for electrical applications. And then last but not least, we have extrusion billet. We supply cut billet or we supply log length, depending what our customers want. Now, all these products have their own technical challenge. <clears throat> um, not surprisingly, our customers, when we ship them an ingot, they like to use most of it. They don't like to take scalping scrap, edge scrap, butt scrap. So there's a lot of challenges in terms of the, the casting technology to produce a good macrostructure. 
the, the, um, the additional thing in extrusion billet, we have an extra, I would say, complexity. We, it's the only product where we apply a heat treatment. We apply an homogenization cycle to control the microstructure. So we're going to be talking about extrusion billet today. And here you can see two big fans of extrusion billet. So if you're, if you're a visitor to Canada, the guy on the left wearing jeans is Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. And the guy on right is uh, Premier Queer of Quebec. OK, so let's look a little bit about some of the applications for extrusions. And I don't think I need to tell anybody here what's, what's driving the use of aluminum in automotive. It's all about light weighting. And it's driven by targets for CO2 emissions and fuel consumption. So I'm sure you've all seen this type of chart. So basically, Europe and Japan are leading the way in their targets. And the rest of the world, including North America and Canada, is, is following. But it's happening everywhere. And the crystal ball that most companies use to try and predict where the growth is going to be and what capacity we need to put online, there's a report that comes out called the Ducker Report, which gives market trends. And here we're just showing what they expect the growth in different product forms in North American vehicles to be for aluminum. And what I've circled there is the extrusions and what they're predicting. In fact, what we're in right now is about two pounds or a kilogram per year growth per vehicle of the use of aluminum extrusions. And here's a good example of where extrusions are used. They're used widely in crash systems. Because you can make complex multi-void hollows that are very stiff and they have good energy absorption. So on the left there, you can see a front-end crash system. At the front, you've got a bumper. And you can see that's been cold formed and there's, there's some pinching operations on that. And then behind that, you can see the crash cans, and these are designed to, to plastically collapse during a collision and absorb en energy. The right-hand side, you can see a, a stiffer, that's a rear uh, crush system. And there you can see it's, it's a two-void hollow for the bumper and a fairly, fairly stiff uh, crash box. So some of the challenges we already see is, as I just showed, a lot of these parts are formed um, before assembly, so they're extruded. They're typically shipped in the T4 temper to, uh, to the assembler or the fabricator. And we're already seeing problems in forming of some of these parts just in the T4 condition. So here is a bumper, and it's had one of those pinching operations to form an attachment point. And you can see in the top there, it's, it's cracked in the transverse direction, whereas the bottom one was good. So we get a lot of questions these days. Why did this one crack? Why was this one good? And obviously, there are many factors that can, that can control that. Um, crash systems themselves, there's two types of crush or crash. There's axial and lateral. We're showing examples here. On the right-hand side, you've got a very good uh, crush. You've got an axial crush and a lateral crush at the top for 6063, which is a fairly soft alloy. On the left, as you go stronger, obviously the ductility drops, and we've got cracking both in lateral and axial crush. And the challenge really is how do you get um, stronger and stronger alloys that can give more energy absorption, that are lighter, that can still survive uh, uh, axial crush or lateral crush. Um, there are a lot of uh, structural extrusions in use today as well. So this, this is a vehicle, the F-150, I'm sure most people are aware of. Uh, so on the left-hand side there, you can see the, the very front extrusion. It's actually, they call it the roof rail. So it's an extrusion that's it's, uh, it's stretch bent and then it's hydroformed. And then above that, you can see the windshield header, again, which is cold formed. And behind that, there's a roof bow. On the right-hand side, you can see exposed away is what they call the rocker or side sill. And if you see, look carefully, you can see how that's actually attached to the rest of the body by self-piercing rivets. And what you find is self-piercing riveting is actually a very good ductility test. <clears throat> so here, on the left-hand side here, you can see that's more detail of that rocker profile I was talking about. Quite a difficult profile to extrude. It's got a, three voids in it, got some very difficult flanges. Most of these profiles are all about two to three millimeters thick. So they're quite challenging for the extruder as well uh, to be able to extrude them uh, to efficient speeds and also to be able to quench them. And in, in all alloy development for, for extrusions, there's always this balance between properties and extrudability. You need an, need an alloy you can process at a reasonable cost. 
I mentioned self-pacing riveting. Uh, on the left of this figure, you can see um, that's a jig we made, or NIC made, so we can do our own self-pacing riveting test. It's set up on a uh, tensile test frame. And basically, the self-pacing rivet is like a pie-shaped rivet. It's a steel rivet that's pushed into the two, uh, the two sheets, the two extrusions you're trying to join. And that's forced in, and the excess material comes out the bottom on the tail side into a little die. And what the simulation there is showing is it's a damage model. So the areas that are red are the areas of highest damage. You can see we expect to see most damage on the bottom of the tail side at the edges of the kind of nugget you form on the, on the, on the tail side. And just some examples of that. This is just 6061. On the left, we have water quench material. You can see we actually get some fine cracks around that, that, that tail side. Whereas if you air quench it, the cracking is much worse. Um, so one of the challenges is it's not, it's not just uh, designing enough ductility to survive crash. It's actually just providing enough ductility to survive a range of fabrication techniques. So let's look at some of the, the, the uh, strength ductility testing that we did. Um, when we first got into this, uh, we decided rather than just to try and jump in and develop new alloys, we'd just test the five or six existing alloys that we supply for automotive applications. And these are all 6,000 series alloys. And they're represented here on this magnesium silicon plot by the red dots. The colored boxes are just the AA specifications. And the two black lines are the balance lines. So the upper one is the traditional MG2SI balance line, and that's how many years ago we used to design extrusion alloys. So alloys like 6061, 6063 are based on that line. Uh, the line on the right is the one-to-one -one atomic ratio, and that's really the way, I guess, the consensus in the industry today is that's the way to best def def design a 6,000 series alloys for extrudability and strength, and that really comes out of all the work done on atom probe and high resolution microscopy in the last 20 years where we now think the, the aging precipitate is closer to one to one than to two to one. So we had a range of alloys on both of those lines. You can see for the one to one line, we have 6060, 6005A, 6082. 6082 is becoming a very popular alloy for, in North America for structural uh, automotive applications. And we had two versions, one, one without chrome and one with chromium. And additionally, we also had an alloy called 6008, which is an alloy it's developed by Alice Swiss for some of the early Audi space frame programs. And this is, it's like a 6005A, but it has a vanadium addition. And we'll, we'll come back to that. So we took those alloys, uh, we extruded them. We have a pilot scale, 850 to 4 inch experimental press. We extruded them into this profile, which is a two millimeter wall, which is typical of uh, uh, most uh, commercial extrusions. Um, we used two types of quenching. On the left here, there you can see what's called a standing wave, or it's a full water quench, and we also air quenched. And we developed a little device you can see at the bottom there. It's basically a waterproof uh, high speed a Wi Fi logger. So, and you can see the cooling rates there. We got a difference in cooling rate of about two orders of magnitude. So for air cooling, we got about four a second, and for water quenching, we're all, we were almost at 1,000 a second. Uh, for the aging, we developed aging curves, as you might expect. And then we took the peak age condition, and then we also selected conditions for 10 and 20% softening on the yield strength, either by under-aging or over-aging. So when I show the data later, you'll see about five or six points for each alloy, and it's basically all these different tempers. Uh, for the crush testing, we just took a 150 millimeter length and crushed it to 60 millimeters. You can see on the top right there, that's the typical force displacement curve you get for a, for a crush test. So every one of those peaks is actually one of the folds that forms on the profile. And the way most people handle this data is that they use an averaging technique and they convert that to what's called the mean crush force, which you can see on the bottom right there. And you take the stable portion of that curve and that's, that's the mean crush force value and that's our measure of energy absorption. And obviously one of the goals is to increase the en energy absorption in these structures while try trying to keep them light. Um, so um, most of the car makers 
when they're building aluminum crash systems, they have a, a visual rating. They, they, they can tolerate a certain amount of cracking in the crush, but they have a limit. Um, so we developed our own visual rating here. You can see we had, for us, one was no cracks, nine was full disintegration. And although this is a visual assessment, it, it is actually semi-quantitative because the cracks tend to project, uh, develop from the corners of the profile to the inside folds, to the outside folds. So you can actually, as you'll see later, it's actually semi-quantitative. And finally, we wanted some way of measuring the, uh, the ductility simply of these materials. So we tried using the fracture strain. So we just measured the reduction of area in a tensile test by a, a image analysis technique. And you'll see how that worked out in a minute. So let's look at some results. That's what we did. Let's look at some results. Um, these are the microstructures for what we call the soft alloys. So we divided the alloys into two groups. We said anything less than 270 megapascals yield strength was a soft alloy. Um, so you can see here, they're all, they all give a, a nice, fine, recrystallized grain size after extrusion. That's because the manganese contents and chromium contents are all less than about 0.1, so there's very low dispersoid content. And here we're looking at the mean crush force for those alloys versus yield strength. So each one of those lines is a different alloy, and all the points on those lines are just the different tempers. So it looks to be a lot of scatter there. What, what you're actually seeing, there's a kind of hysteresis effect. As we go clockwise for each alloy, we're going from underage to peak age, back to overage. And the underage always gives about 5% higher uh, uh, cr mean crush force than overaged. So actually, um, yield strength is not a very good predictor of crush force. And we tried a number of different parameters, but we found simply that UTS is the simplest way to, to, to predict the energy from a simple tensile test. So that, the initial data I showed there was for water quenched. Now I've added the air quenched data, and it still, still fits a good trend with UTS. Uh, the one difference now is you can see a lot more of those circle points. Uh, those circle points are the points where we got cracking. Basically, when we went from water quenched to air quenched, we got a lot more cracking in, in crush, and we couldn't actually get a crack-free crush uh, above about 230 megapascals yield. So we're starting to see that one of the biggest parameters affecting crush performance and ductility is the quench rate. And you can see that effect here. On the left, is the air quenched uh, crush sample. This is for a high strength 6063. So we've got cracking at the corners of that sample. Then on the right hand side, we've got the full water quench. It's crack free and it's actually about 20 me megapascals stronger. So, how can we predict the behavior in crush? How can we predict cracking? Um, so, here we're looking at our crush rating versus tensile elongation. So tensile elongation works pretty good in traditional markets like building and construction. We, we've used it for a long time to predict simple bending operations, but it's not very effective in these high deformation situations like, uh, like crush. So if you recall, our crush rating is one is no cracks, and the higher the number, the more cracking we get. So what this diagram shows is for a pretty reasonable elongation of about 8%, we may or may not get cracking. Okay, most of these soft alloys, we didn't see a lot of cracking in the water quench condition. If I now add on the air quenched results, you see elongation is even worse. Now we can get a pretty respectable 15% tensile elongation, and that still doesn't tell us if we're going to crack or not in crush. What we think is a better measure is this fracture strain. Okay, so now you can see this is for water quenched material. So as we, as we decrease the fracture strain, we get to a value of about 0.7, which seems to be a critical value for the particular profile that we selected. And then we start to get cracking. And now if we add on our air quenched results, it gets even worse. The, the fracture strain uh, drops, the crush rating gets worse. So we think it's a pretty good predictor. So we said that um, mean crush force tells us everything we need to know about energy absorption. We said fracture strain tells us everything or almost everything we want to know about ductility. So if you plot those two parameters, it should allow us to pick the best material for a given application. So this is that plot. Um, 
So on the top there, we've got the water quenched material. And as you might expect, the stronger we make the material, the, the lower the ductility. But the big effect is if you go to the open symbols at the bottom, as we go to air quenching, we're dropping the fracture strain by a value of about 0.3, significant drop. And if we take our profile where we think the critical value is about 0.7, then it says if we go from air quenching to water quenching, we can actually increase the strength by about 40 megapascals and still not get cracking. And the reason for that is, is what ha what's happening to the grain boundary microstructure when we change the quench rate. So here we're looking at some, uh, it's the 6063, it's been as extruded and, and quenched. And we're looking at the grain structure or the grain boundaries after we separated them by uh, liquid gallium. And you can see on the left hand side the water quenched material, how shiny that, that those grain boundaries are. We just have a few constituent particles, but there's no uh, MGSI precipitates. Whereas on the right hand side, the slower cooled microstructure, you can see all the uh, MGSI precipitates. And this obviously makes the boundaries weaker and they'll separate at a lower stress. Situation is a little bit more complicated when you age that. Now, after aging, even on the left-hand side with the water quenched material, we're starting to see some visible precipitates on those boundaries, but uh, the air quenched material is always, always the worst. So let's switch now and look at the stronger alloys, the medium strength alloys. Um, so now when we go to medium strength alloys, typically we start to add manganese and chrome. That's just historically what people have done. It's done for grain structure control, it's done for ostensibly for ductility control. And I've just arranged those alloys from left to right just with increasing dispersoid content. So for example, on the left, the 6008 actually has a very low dispersoid content. It's the manganese less than 0.1. <clears throat> so it actually looks like one of the soft alloys in terms of grain structure. But then as we move right to 6061, 6005A, we're starting to add manganese and chrome. Still a fully recrystallized structure now, but the grains are getting more elongated. And then as we go to 6082, where now we have about 0.5 manganese, you can see we've actually kept a fibrous grain structure in the center of the extrusion. But we've got a pretty awful coarse grain at the surface. And then as we add chromium to that, and the last alloy, you can see now we're starting to try and retain mostly a fibrous structure throughout the profile with just a thin recrystallized layer on the surface. And um, I should point out that um, there's many things you can do in the extrusion process, homogenization, dye, dye design to control the surface recrystallization. In, in this testing, we just wanted to take the microstructures we got and just to see what the, the impact on, uh, on crush was. You can see there at the bottom, as we go from left to right, these, those are the etched microstructures, and we can just see a general increase in dispersoid content from left to right. Uh, I guess the interesting one is on the, the left-hand side, bottom left. I think you can see like a striation through that microstructure. And this is actually the vanadium addition made to 6008. So when you add vanadium to a DC ingot, it segregates peritectically. It's got very low diffusivity, so it actually, the segregation survives homogenization. And when you extrude it, you get layers of high and low vanadium. And uh, some people think that's beneficial, beneficial for a crush performance. People do the same thing. People add titanium for the same reason. So how do those perform in crush? Uh, well, all these alloys now, they're much stronger, and we get cracking in every case. Uh, probably there, the best one is the top right, the 6008, and the worst one is the bottom left, which is the 6082. And we can rationalize a lot of this behavior if we actually look at the grain structures. So what we've done here, we've taken our crush sample, and we sectioned it through the corner to see where the cracking's occurring. So on the right hand side is a 6008 with a nice fine grain size and we can see only superficial cracking on the, on the bends there. The worst one by far is the one in the middle which is the coarse grain 6082 which is a bit of a disaster. We've got cracking there, intergranular cracking almost the whole way through the profile. Uh, but the interesting one is on the left, that's the 6082 with chrome and although we've got cracking in the coarse grain at the surface, there's no penetration of the fibrous grain structure underneath. So it tells us a couple of things. It tells us we can be quite successful in crush with the structure on the right, and we could be pretty successful in crush with the one on the left if we could get rid of the coarse grain at the surface. So there seem to be a two approaches to get good, good crush behavior. 
So now, how does our fracture strain uh, parameter work for these alloys? Um, so we're again looking at crush rating versus fracture strain. Um, it's not quite as neat and tidy as it was for the soft alloys. It, the diagram tells us a few things. So those gray triangles on the top left, that, that's the worst material. And again, that was the coarse grain 6082. Um, the plot actually works quite good for the 6008, which is the blue points. There's still quite a clear cutoff as fracture strain drops to about 0.7. Um, but we have a lot of points on the right-hand side. We've got pretty good fracture strains of, of over one, and the, but the, we're still getting cracking and crush. And the problem there is it's the 6082 with chrome. And what the problem is, our fracture strain is really an average across the thickness. And in reality, of course, we've got these duplex structures. And when you're, when you're doing crush or doing bending, it's the surface that gets the, the most severe deformation. And so we're not really allowing for the, uh, the effect of the surface microstructure. So but if we add the data for the medium strength alloys to our famous fracture strain UTS plot, uh, we just see a general degradation. I, the stronger the alloy, the lower the ductility. We were kind of disappointed. We were hoping some alloys might actually stand out from the curve. Obviously, we'd like an alloy to be a, above or to the right of that curve. But there's just a general deterioration. It does, however, tell us a few things. It tells us things, some things what not to do. So, for example, the points I've circled there, that's the coarse grain 6082. It tells us we need to control uh, grain structure and microstructure. But for this profile, probably the best solution would be something there. It's maybe an overage 6082 or uh, 6008. Um, so that was medium strength alloys. There's a big debate right now in the extrusion industry about how to go to higher strength materials. And the same thing's happening in the sheet world. There's a lot of work being done now on 70-75 alloy for automotive sheet. Uh, and obviously, the driver is just to go thinner and uh, reduce weight. Um, in, the, in the world of extrusion, 70-75 has very poor extrudability. So the alloys people are focusing on are what's called the dilute 7000. So it's aluminum, zinc, mag, no copper. And I'm showing the alloys there on this um, <coughs> magnesium zinc plot. <coughs> So it's alloys like 7046, 7108. They're the newer brand of 7,000 alloys. They use zirconium instead of manganese and chrome. Um, but these alloys are the one, uh, I guess, the, there's a number of problems with these alloys in the industry. There's a, they're not readily available. There's not, uh, scrap solutions are not readily in place. And also there's a big concern about stress corrosion cracking, which was one of the main problems when these were introduced in the 70s and 80s. Um, so when we process these materials, we actually air quench them because that's the, that is the traditional route for these alloys. You air quench to reduce residual stress to avoid stress corrosion cracking. And we also peak aged and over aged and we, we didn't do any under aging because again, that's bad for stress corrosion cracking historically. So when you extrude them, you get microstructures that are pretty much fully fibrous because in this system, you use zirconium as a dispersoid former which is very effective in these low silicon alloys. And now if we add those to our, our fracture strain UTS plot, again, we just see a continue, it's, it's all on the same curve. We get some pretty useful strength now. We, we can be up to 450 megapascals tensile strength, but we're still seeing the same ductility trend. Now, to be fair, for the 6,000s on that graph, they're all water quenched and the 7,000s are air quenched. Maybe if we water quench the 7,000, you'd see them lift up. Um, so the alternative to um, 7,000 is high strength 6,000. And if you want to go above about 350 megapascals yield, then you need to add copper and a fair amount of copper. So there are traditional alloys already out there, like 6066, 6056. So we included some of those in our testing. And you can see the microstructures here. Again, they're designed to be pretty much fully fibrous grain. And now if we add those to our graph, you can see they're pretty much in the same place as the, uh, the 7,000. So those are the, the, the blue and red squares. Um, again, that's water quenched. And maybe 7,000s do have an advantage if you water quench them. Maybe that's something we need to look at in the future. 
So I'd like to switch now and talk a little bit about uh, where we're going next. What, what are the future directions for research? And we think the, the way ahead really is, is to use a through process modeling approach. So this uh, schematically shows the, uh, the processing route for an automotive extrusion. So we DC cast the billet, we homogenize it, and obviously both those processes we do in house. Uh, the billet goes to the extruder, uh, he extrudes that, and he press quenches it. And normally you would say if quenching was part of the extrusion process, but because of the importance for ductility, we were considering it a separate step. And then the difference with traditional markets is typically for automotive, the extrusions leave the extrusion plant in the T4 temper. And they're formed or fabricated, and then the final assembly is heat treated. And obviously then the assembly goes to the car maker to put into the vehicle. So the approach we're taking is to, is to as I said, the through process modeling approach. We already have models in place to simulate solidification and homogenization. So we can simulate our, our step of the process. We have models for extrusion, and we're working on models for um, press quenching and artificial aging. So uh, the homogenization step, the more we study it, the more complex we find it is. So in, in the old days, we used to empirically try and develop homogenization cycles, but we've come to the realization that there's just too many uh, metallurgical reactions occurring during that process. So on the right there, you can see the microstructure of a 6082. So we can see we've got dispersoids, we've got constituent particles, we've got dispersoid-free zones, we've got solid solution levels. So it's a fairly complex microstructure for what's considered a fairly simple alloy. And if you look at the homogenization cycle, and we're just showing a schematic there in temperature and time, if we take the cast billet and we go through the process, there's all kinds of phase changes. We've got precipitation of MGSI, we nucleate the dispersoids as we're heating up to the soak temperature. Uh, we dissolve the MG2SI again as we go up with the solvers. Uh, we typically remove microsegregation before we get to the soak temperature. Dispersoids grow, constituent particle phase change, all kinds of growth and long range diffusion effects. So there's all kinds of um, steps occurring at the same time. And really, the only way we think to handle that is, is using a modeling approach. And obviously, when we cool down, we drop below the solvice again, and we re-precipitate MG2SI. So what I'd like to show now is just an example of uh, some work we've done um, um, on measurements and also modeling. And it shows where modeling can actually help you understand better what's going on in, time, in terms of the microstructure. So I'm, what I'm showing here, this was a, a PhD student at UBC, Cheng Lu, and he made two observations in, in his practical work. On the left, we're looking at some microprobe measurements that he made. So he was, he was trying to measure um, the level of different elements in the dendrites. So he's using the microprobe, he's looking at the dendrite, and obviously he doesn't know what he's measuring. He's measuring solid solution plus dispersoids. Um, and on the left-hand part of the diagram, you can see on the left-hand side, we've got as-cast material. And then as we move right, we're just going to more and more intense homogenization cycles. So longer times, higher temperatures. And the black line is for manganese. And it tells us the manganese in the dendrites is always decreasing when we increase the homogenization. And that's what we expect. The manganese, we know, diffuses to the constituent particles. And if we leave it long enough, it will diffuse down to the equilibrium level predicted by a thermocalc. But what's interesting is the red points. He actually found that the iron content in the dendrites actually increases during homogenization until right at the end, as you, as you approach equilibrium, it drops down again. So that's one observation. The second one on the right-hand side, he was doing TM measurements by EDX of the, of the particle chemistries. And what he found is he uh, increased the, um, the intensity of the homogenization. The manganese to iron ratio actually decreased. So we're going from blue to, to red, uh, sorry, red, black to red to blue, black to red to blue. So if you're going left on that uh, bottom right-hand diagram, you can see the, uh, the manganese to iron ratio is actually dropping. So the question is why, what's causing that effect? And, um, so we looked at this in the model, and the nice thing about models is you can pull out parameters you could never possibly measure. 
So here we're looking at the, uh, the flux of the manganese atoms and the iron atoms during homogenization. So on the left-hand side, um, we're looking at, um, that's the effect of manganese. So the zero point is the center of the dendrite, and on the right-hand side of that diagram, that's the constituent particle. And you can see that for an, when, the, um, when the value of flux is positive, that means you've got diffusion from the dendrite center to the constituent particle. So what that diagram is saying is that for commercially significant homogenization times, you've got the, the red, the purple, the blue curves, we've always got manganese diffusing into the constituent particle. If you look on the right-hand side, it's completely the reverse. So iron, most of the time, is in the negative zone. Again, for commercially significant times, iron is always diffusing from the constituent particle into the matrix. It's basically diffusing into the um, dispersoid particles to, to reduce their free energy. And it's only when most of the manganese is diffused back into the constituent that the iron diffuses back again. So it's a simple result, and it, it tells us that the iron plays a significant role in the nucleation and growth of these dispersoid particles. So an element we consider typically an impurity in these medium strength alloys actually could play an important role in controlling the dispersoid structure. And Warren Poole is going to give a paper this week on that, to give more detail on that subject. Um, at the other end of the, uh, the process, uh, we're also looking at modeling, but modeling to try and predict, predict the performance of materials in crush and, and defamation. So quite often we'll get a, a customer or an end user saying, I've got this particular side sill profile, which would be the best alloy and temper to give me this, this rating of crush? Um, so this is there's some work we're doing with, uh, with NRC. And basically, we're trying to do damage prediction. And what we're doing, we're using a sample. It's, a, it's, um, it's a called a butterfly sample. It was developed by MIT. And the sample, you, by stressing it in different directions, you can apply different stress states, so shear, uh, biaxial, et cetera. Um, what we're trying to develop is what's called a failure surface, as you can see on the top right there. And this, this is really just a map of how the damage develops in different stress states. And once you have that, then you can feed that into these uh, models such as LS Diner that most uh, engineers use to predict deformation. And here's an example of that. This is 6082 T6 in lateral crush. And you can see the simulation there based on, on measurements of the damage surface. And the prediction of cracking is pretty close to what we get in the actual sample. But if you want to be really good at uh, a prediction of uh, cracking and deformation, there's all kinds of details you need to pay attention to. For example, we have anisotropy in extrusions. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, we're looking at anisotropy of the yield strength. So the black line at the top, that's 6082. It's a fibrous structure, so we've got a plain strain texture, and we always get a significant softening in the 45-degree de direction. On the right-hand side of the diagram, we're looking at bend testing. And the, there's a test called the VDA bend test, which is a three-point bend. And that's it's probably becoming the most standard test in, in automotive ductility right now. But you can see there, as we go for pretty much any alloy, it doesn't matter if it's fibrous or recrystallized, as we go from longitudinal to transverse, we always see a drop in ductility. And there are also some through thickness effects we need to take account of. <clears throat> Here's an alloy, it's a 6063 alloy. You can see the grain structure looks fine recrystallized. You would think that would be pretty uniform through the thickness. But in reality, we have changes in texture. So the surface of that profile, we've got a rotated cube texture, whereas the core is a mixture of cube and goss. And that can have an effect on the, the R value distribution. So what we're looking at in the bottom there are cross sections through just 10 cell samples that we've, we've stopped before failure, and we've taken a cross section to look at the shape of the, of the, uh, of the, the tensile. So on the top, we've got the full thickness samples. On the bottom, we've removed the surface by caustic etching. And on the left is longitudinal, on the right is transverse. So you can see on the left, the longitudinal is pretty isotropic. But on the right-hand side, the full thickness 
there's actually a discrepancy in our value between the surface and the core. The core actually wants to shrink more than the center. And obviously, when we remove the, the surface layers by etching at the bottom right, you can see that we, get, we go back to be, being isotropic. So we think this can have an effect on the, uh, on the initiation of damage during crush. Okay, so that's my final slide. I don't, because this is a plenary, I don't really want to draw any detailed technical conclusions. I think, um, I think it's pretty obvious that with the demands for higher strength, higher ductility uh, for automotive extrusions, it presents an interesting set of challenges for the whole process route, for the billet supplier, for the extruder, for the manufacturer as well. And I think, I guess the good news is there's plenty of work there for grad students and uh, metallurgists for many years to come as we dig into the detail. And the second point I'd like to leave you with, I, th I think we're pretty convinced the approach to solve these problems is through, uh, through process modeling. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. And I'll leave you with a picture of our Ile Malin Dam in Quebec.